edition of Virtual Global Spine Conference. I'm um, here with our usual cast of faculty and um, growing panel of experts and uh, spine surgery colleagues from across the globe. Uh, tonight, it's a real pleasure to have with us um, our colleague, Dr. Martin Pham from University of California, San Diego. Um, he's a uh, uh, pioneering spine surgeon to uh, robotics and minimally invasive techniques uh, and is a real uh, champion and advocate for surgical education. And uh, I think if you're interested in his work, uh, there have been a number of publications and operative neurosurgery that have come out recently. Um, and uh, we're really uh, pleased to have him uh, share his expertise with us tonight. Um, as usual, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll do our best to uh, keep those in mind and try to pose those to the faculty as well as. Um, but and it's a great pleasure to please, uh, please get started. All right, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for that introduction, uh, Dr. Shin. Let me share my screen here. All right, so um, again, uh, it's it's a real pleasure to, to be here at the Virtual Global Spine Conference. Um, you know, I uh, it, it was something I remember, especially when the pandemic first started, it was such a, a great idea. And just as all of us, you know, all the faculty and I'm sure all the participants, um, we all really like and care about the spine. And so having this constant exposure and education and discourse um, has been such a, a really valuable thing. And, um, you know, so, you know, fairly straightforward block of things. Now, when it comes to an introduction to spinal robotics, you know, the, the topic of robots can be um, very touchy for some. And I know a lot of people have a lot of different opinions, especially when it comes to uh, robotics in medicine and robotics in surgery. But um, I promise for this talk, the robots are, are very nice and it's gonna be um, you know, very, very straightforward and, and easy to, uh, to acclimate to. When I think about my training, right? And especially when I was first introduced to robotics, for me, my training background was with, you know, at USC with John Liu, Pat Shea, Frank Acosta, and then in fellowship with uh, Larry Lanky and Ron Lehman, right? And so all of these folks um, taught me how to freehand. Right. And so, you know, instilled in me was this just appreciation and respect for the bony anatomy. And so we freehanded everything from C1 all the way down to S2AI. We were very comfortable. And the idea of using other technologies and, and to us, other technologies were things like navigation and even fluoroscopy was, um, you know, was almost blasphemy. Right. Because it was admitting or uh, essentially insinuating that you didn't know the anatomy. And so with this in mind, you know, all of these skills and all of these philosophies passed down, you know, these were the cases that were in my training. And all of these screws were freehanded and we were very, very comfortable um, from C1 all the way down to S2AI. And so, you know, with all of these cases under my belt, when I, uh, when I heard about um, all these assistive technologies, I mean, for me, uh, as maybe some of you, I, I sort of thought of myself, well, I'm, I'm already a rock star, right? I can freehand everything. I know the bones. I, th there's, there's nothing else that I need, right? I'm at the top of my game. I'm, I'm excellent. So, you know, when people started talking about robotics, uh, as many of you thought, I was very skeptical, of it, right? Here comes just another piece of technology. We talked about navigation. We talked about, you know, extended um, you know, imaging things, and now there's robotics. It's just another um, fad, another distraction from getting me away from, from real spine surgery. And so they're telling me about these robotically assisted surgeries. And for me, assistive technologies or assistive things, I think of, you know, like a wheelchair or a cane or like a seeing eye dog. Right? I mean, these are assistive things for people who just can't do certain things. So when they were telling me about, you know, robot assisted surgery, I, I was pretty sour about it. And again, dismissed it, didn't care for it, um, turned the other way until uh, during my fellowship, I actually had the, um, the fortune to train under Ron Lehman. And so Ron was the one who introduced to me for an entire year, robotics. And this really changed my viewpoint 
on it. And you can actually see here, um, and you know, the robot making a cameo at the center of the screen in one of our cases. And so for this talk, this is not a talk about evidence or accuracy or pulling the literature. You know, um, all of us can, can do our own data mining in PubMed and come to our own conclusions. This talk is more of, of a philosophical talk on spinal robotics, right? And the way that I believe and hopefully can convince or impress upon you of why spinal robotics in this way is going to be slightly disruptive to how spine surgery is done. Disruptive, controversial, and allow us to do things that just wouldn't have been possible before or would have been very difficult before. And so in this way, when you see this talk, the plot of this is obviously going to be spinal robotics. And the story is going to be told in a lot of the cases that I present. But there are going to be several themes that I bring up. And these are themes and ideas that I try to bring spinal robotics into that are relatable, right? And so I'm gonna tell you what those themes are right now. And then as they come up in the presentation, I'll flag them. The first theme and thematic idea is that of construction, right? So I'll talk about how spinal robotics relates in my view to construction. And as a segue to that, this idea of being an architect, right? The second thematic idea that I'll go over is that of driving, right? And how I, I relate pedicle screws to driving. And again, as a segue to that, this idea of, of being a race car driver. And then the last thematic idea is this uh, partial automation of tasks, right? And so again, all of it a little bit disjointed right now, but hopefully we'll all come together um, as I progress through the rest of the talk. So that was just a brief introduction. In the next section, um, why robotics, right? This is a picture and a video of a Tesla factory, right? So you can see all the robotic arms here, right? Robotic arms are CNC machines, right? So they're machines under computer numerical control. They receive an input and then they execute out that input as an action that is highly accurate, precise, and reproducible. Right, robotics are part of our daily lives. They build our cars, they build our spaceships, they build our textiles, they build a variety of things. And finally, for the first time, we actually get a CNC inside the operating room for the spine. And so in this way, the, the spine robots and the spine robotic platforms are just iterations of tools, right? So you think of a screwdriver and you manually put the screw in by hand into a wall. Then you have um, you know, a power tool. So now you do that same task under power. And then now you have a machine that does it automated, right? So there are just progressions of technology that are accomplishing the same task, either better, faster, more efficiently, more accurately, or more precisely. And that is just the um, progression of technology. So you'll see it flagged up. This is my first thematic idea of construction. Right. As I tell all of my residents, bony fixation, right, which is what robots are used for now in the operating room, that's the equivalent of putting down rebar, right, putting down the cement, putting down the foundation, right, putting in your pedicle screws, putting in your bony fixation. But it is far from the actual surgery itself, right? The actual surgery, the actual building are your grafts and your osteotomies, your rotting, your, your tumor resection, your deformity correction. Your actual surgical goals are the actual building, right? And putting in the pedicle screws just establishes that foundation. Now, the methods of putting in that bony fixation are very well known. You have navigation, fluoro assist, and freehand. And in the era of robotics, I've, I've termed this as intra-op doing, right? All three of these things with pros and cons, you essentially show up in the operating room and you just start doing, right? The way that spinal robotics is different is because it requires pre-op planning. Because it's a CNC machine, it needs a data input. And so it requires your software input to tell it where to go. So when you just look at, for a second, intra-op doing, right, navigation, floral, uh, assist, and freehand, every one of you is very familiar with what that means, right? If you're doing navigation, you go in the operating room, you spin your intra-op CT, and then you, you sort of just do. Right? So you, you look at the screen and in real time, you adjust where you want to go. If you're doing freehand or floral assist, then you look at your anatomical landmarks and then you proceed. And if something is off, then you redirect 
you troubleshoot, you assess. All of this is done in real time intraoperatively in the operating room. That's great for a majority of cases, but when you come across anatomy that's challenging, right? Some of these um, workflows and some of these um, crutches may be much more difficult to do, especially when you have challenging anatomy or, you know, in our day and age, body habitus that is too large, right? It's too large for the fluoroscopy to penetrate. It's too large so that if you're trying to put down a navigated screw, the soft tissue is actually pushing you off trajectory, right? All of these are challenges. And now you find yourself spending all this time on just putting in the pedicle screws, all this time on just trying to get bony fixation, and you haven't even gotten to your actual surgical goal, whatever it may be. So, you know, the potential disadvantages of nav fluoro and freehand are very well known, so I won't go into them in detail, but really all of them have in common this idea of troubleshooting, right? Because you're, you're just doing it on the fly. You're just showing up in the operating room and you're just doing based off of something that you have a mental image of in your mind. And all of those things have caveats with um, errors and things where you have to take time and revisit and correct. So this is where there's a shift, right? And this is one of my favorite pictures that I, that I use. Old ways won't open new doors. So instead of the old ways of what I term intra-op doing, right? nav, fluoro, and freehand, let's open the new doors of pre-op planning, which actually gives us access to spinal robotics. The pre-op planning software allows you to execute exactly what you have in mind in the operating room, right? So all of us have a process of what we want to do, what we want to put, the size of through, the trajectory. And by putting in the software, this records your intent, right? And so this is what pre-op planning is. And no longer are you just showing up in the operating room and just doing. And so in this way, the comparison of workflow that I typically show is if you're just doing nav floor or freehand, typically you review the x-ray or the MRI, you'll do it the night before, you'll do it the morning of, you'll keep it in your mind on what you wanna do. You show up in the operating room and then you just do, right? You spin your arm, you bring in your floor, you expose your anatomical landmarks, you place your screws. Hi, uh, Martin? Yes. Oh. I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Sorry about that. This is Ali Baj. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you so much for doing this. Obviously, we're glad, glad to have you. But in the spirit of, uh, of uh, basically getting right to some of the tough questions and putting our, our guests on the spot and throwing them uh, kind of off their game, quick question for you based yes. on this slide. The first thing, if you don't mind, although this is not CME, of course, but just, just make sure you, 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 you kind of tell us your, your conflicts of interest. That's just an aside. Oh, right. But more importantly, if I'm doing an L4-5, one level L4-5 T-lift, uh, something that's quick, I can do it intraoperatively with either floral or nav. Why do I need to spend uh, whatever it is, 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes before to do pre-op planning for a one level DGEN case? Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to right off the back start with a question. <laughs> no, of course. Well, um, first, my, my disclosures, I realized I didn't have a disclosure slide. Um, I, do can, I do get consulting fees from Medtronic. Um, and that's my only uh, potential conflict of interest. Um, obviously, I've, I've been working on them with this for a lot of things. Um, to answer your question, I'll answer it in two ways. I'll answer it briefly, and then um, I'll actually refer back to it because I actually have later slides to show um, exactly that. Pre-app planning only takes a few minutes, right? And so, you know, I do have a few screenshots to show that with regards to the software, it, it doesn't take that amount of time, right? You know, I show here that in terms of this comparison, there is this investment in time. That time can be in the minutes or that time can be nothing. If your support team, you know, puts that plan together for you and all you have to do is adjust essentially what you would do as if a resident was putting in the screw and you make minor adjustments, right? And so it doesn't take that um, extra amount of time that people need. It's not, I mean, for me, I typically do because I'm interested in it, but that amount of time here and let me see if I can turn on my laser pointer. This amount of time here is variable, right? And the thought is that over the course of say five cases, 10 cases, 20 cases, the reason why I did it this way is the idea of this is that you will reduce your OR time eventually because, and that's because as you pre-up plan and you already decide what your contract design is gonna be, You've already gone through where your entry points are, where your trajectories are, what screws you want to put in. 
you've already looked at the patient's anatomy, right? I mean, how many times have surgeons have we opened something up and we're like, oh, I didn't realize the facets are this big. I didn't realize the pedicles were this small. They were always that big and always that small, but it's a failure of realization on the pre-op imaging, right? In this way, by planning, it forces you to decide what metal you wanna put in because you have to design it, right? And in this way, the idea, and this is the best analogy that I typically make as well, I refer to it as bowling, right? So all of you, most of you, every one of us, if we're excellent bowlers, we just roll down the lane, we knock down all the pins, right? But the reality shows is that that's not always the case. And so there's this troubleshooting of just putting in the bony fixation, right? The idea behind robotics is that the software allows you to execute exactly where you want to go. And with this in place, that means that when you set the robotic arm to where you wanna go, it becomes rigid and fixed, drill, tap, screw, release your screw, send it to the next target and the next level, right? Drill, tap, screw, release the screw. And then you move on with the rest of your life. You move on with the rest of the surgery. And this way, back to this thematic idea of construction, so much less time is spent on bony fixation, right? And you can move on to the rest of the goals of surgery. Now, of course, if you know it's a simple case, and I'll go over this later, I'm not advocating that spine robotics is used in every single surgery, right? And especially if you have a very good workflow, you're very good at something, um, you know, you, you can put in screws minimally invasively without the use of fluoroscopy, then by all means do what's good for you. But in this way, what I'm showing you are the possibilities because this is what it opens up, right? Now, the next um, idea leading to this is essentially that of, of a handyman, right? So putting in screws is very enjoyable. You know, I mean, everyone likes to put in screws as residents. We, you know, we all remember the first time we put in our first screw and learn how to do it and teaching residents, they all wanna put in the screws. And I liken that to being a handyman, you know, putting in screws in the wall. And don't get me wrong, you know, I really enjoy um, doing things at home, right? I've, I've essentially every single DeWalt tool that could possibly be done. I love, you know, putting up shelves, making things, hanging things, fixing things, right? But the idea of putting in screws as if that's the end all and be all is that's where the error in understanding is because if all you're doing is thinking about putting in the pedicle screws, right? Then you don't have time to really think of the bigger picture of the surgical goal itself. And this is where I make the analogy of being an architect because when you start thinking and getting into the mindset of designing, right? This is what opens up the possibilities because now, I mean, you know, notwithstanding a single level fusion, you can start thinking of a two level, a three level, a multi-level construct. And it opens up possibilities that robotics is giving that would not have been possible before. And something that I'll go into, obviously in a lot of the, the cases that I'll show as well. But this is where the idea of moving away from the idea of just being a handyman and, and putting all your attention and skill into putting in a screw. And instead, putting in your surgical skill into the design of the surgical goals, which can now be recorded, which can now be put into software and which can now, um, you know, with the assistance of a robotic arm and CNC machine, you now have an assistive device to accomplish these more complicated surgical goals. Now, moving on to cases, right? So in these cases, and I wanna be sure I stay within time, the cases that I, that I have here are broken up into essentially two, um, two separate categories. The first part is um, a section where, you know, there are cases that are very common that I think a lot of people have done and familiar with, um, things like an MIS T-lift, things like open deformity, right? So these are cases that I'll show with, with the use of the spinal robotics platform. The second part of cases are things where, in my view, at least at UC San Diego, have only been possible with the use of the robotic arm. And these are things, what I've termed as SRSPS, which is simultaneous robotic, single position, single position surgery, as well as MIS deformity, right? So these are the, the cases in the second part will really highlight that just going beyond the current, what we are doing, why the purpose of this talk is an idea of, of why I believe spinal robotics to be disruptive, why I believe it to be a paradigm shift so that it's not just what we're doing in spine surgery, but 
how it's allowing us to do brand new things, controversial things, but still brand new things. Okay, so there are going to be a lot of cases, right? And you know, um, certainly, please feel free to ask questions, Dr. Bauer. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, but with the number of cases here, the goal of it is that it it will be fairly fast paced. And what I want you to do is just soak it in, right? Um, as I go case by case, although not all of them may have as much you know detail for discussion. What I want you to take away is the impression of how, in the first part, spinal robotics can integrate into a lot of cases that a lot of people do, such as MIST lifts and open deformity, but also how spinal robotics is opening other doors, right? And why, again, as I'll keep saying over and over, why I believe this to be a shift in how a lot of people can do spine surgery. Okay, so for part one, MIST lift and open deformity, so a one level T-lift, right? So um, to Dr. Baj's question earlier, here's a one level T-lift, right? So something that people can do very quickly with the robotic arm, it doesn't change. It just changes how you do it, right? So whether you do it with Floro, whether you do it with NAB or whether you do it with the robot, right? I think for this particular case, it's very similar. This is just to show the great apposition of the plan to the screws. So never again do I have to worry about penetration of fluoroscopy. Never again do I have to worry about losing a K wire. Never again do I have to worry about putting down an instrument with NAV, slipping off or not having my resident be perfectly coaxial to the plant, right? This is what it looks like, right? So there's my mini open approach. This is the screw going in. The arm is already in place. This is an ATS screw, so I didn't tap. The screw is going down. You can see the rigidity of the arm. My assist has already put in his screws on his side, as you can tell uh, right here. The screw goes down, I detach the driver, the arm is then sent to the next position, right? And again, like I've been saying, you move on with your life, right? No longer is it about so much focus on putting down the screws, right? For the next case, right, a two-level T-lift, right? Something that's very familiar for a lot of you. Again, you can see four, five, five, one T-lift, and you can again see good apposition of that plan, right? So don't have to worry a bit, again, like what I said earlier, putting down K-wire, shooting fluoroscopy, spinning the nav, spinning the O-arm, losing track of where my pilot hole was, right? Skiving off a piece of bone. You can see here um, something that you've been never been able to see before with nav, the teal is the plan and the purple is the screw. And I'm gonna start this video and you can see the arm is rigid. Right, so unlike NAV, where you put it down and you know, you're know you watching for your resident assist to make sure he doesn't ice cream cone out or be off trajectory, right? Or angle it the wrong way, the arm is guiding you. And you now have a visual confirmation of your screw going down your plan, right? No cost in time, it's just a visual reassurance, right? Another case, a T4 to pelvis, right? So something that's um, very commonly done so this is a gentleman that came to me with sagittal imbalance, right? So planned all the screws. In this case, it's a big surgery, right? He has a Harrington rod, he has a fusion mass. I'm already worrying about how I'm gonna cut through the mass, you know, figure out where all my anatomical landmarks are, you know, take out the old instrumentation, figure out what that is. But the least of my worries, the very least of my worries is putting in the screws because now you can see the plan with placement of the screws, the plan, with placement of the screws, the plan with placement of the screws, right? The surgery is already hard enough in and of itself, but now I can put all of my focus and attention. And instead of worrying about putting in all the screws, I can worry about doing my bone cuts, doing my T-lifts at the bottom, doing my rotting, right? I haven't burnt out my cognitive reserve struggling with the pedicle screws. And instead I can put in all the screws and now get to the actual work, which is correcting his deformity. Right. So again, a use of spinal robotics and something that's commonly done. Another example, right? a T9 to pelvis. In this one, I'm actually going to show you what the planning is like. So this is optional. right? So this is what's known as our, uh, the Mazor Exalign software. This is the predictive planning. right? You can see here I'm dialing in PCOs. For this deformity, I'm trying to figure out, do I have to do a PSO? Or in this very sick lady, if I can just do four very aggressive PCOs, and will that be enough? I dial down my, my PCOs to eight degrees, right? Something very you know, conservative. And you can see here, my PILL mismatch is coming down to green, right? I'm gonna go back. This is just me derotating the spine and straightening her out. 
But you can see here, as I go back, the PILL mismatch down in the uh, lower left-hand corner is red. It's out to about 37 degrees. With four PCOs that are aggressive and ideal at about eight degrees, I bring her back in the green, right? So this is this you know predictive software is letting me try to plan to avoid instead a big you know complex reconstruction. I mean her lumbar lordosis is five degrees, but predicted I can get her back to say 37 degrees ideal, and my my mismatch is going to be within uh, normal. You can see this is the, the, um, the predictive analytics, and this was the actual, right? So again, I have five degrees of lordosis here, corrected to 38 degrees, right? Again, I'm gonna go back to the software. This was the predicted. Again, I'm giving myself about eight degrees of, of uh, lordosis per, per PCO. And here, the actual, right? So very, very accurate with regards to what I'm trying to do it for, right? So good outcome for her. And you can see here, pre-op and post-op. And again, with this type of design, I already knew that I was gonna do a multi-rod uh, multi construct for this open surgery because none of the screws lined up, right? But in this way, I go in knowing that it's just gonna be four rods and putting them down and aligning them. Right? Again, a difficult surgery in and of itself, but putting in the screws was the least of my concerns at this point. And I could focus more on the osteotomies and the actual correction derotation and correction of her lordosis. Right. The last um, open deformity that I have is a T4 to pelvis revision. So this was a gentleman who came into me prior T4 to pelvis already. And as you'll see here, he had pseudoed at the distal construct. You can see here, complete haloing of his S1 screws. He had a haloing of his iliac screw. Um, unrelated, he had a chronic infection, right? So his hardware was already thought to be, um, you know, already had a biofilm with a chronic infection. He had a, an IR drain for it, but really he had a main, right? So what I wanted to do was take out those screws and put in a uh, quad iliac fixation. Now, the only iliac fixation he had left was essentially going through S2 AI, right? I mean, he already blown his S1. Um, he already taken out uh, the iliac on one side. So my goal was to, to fixate him to the sacral ilium get him back his uh, stability. And in this way, because he had a chronic infection, we just did an exchange of his hardware, right? So you can see here, this is what it looked like. And again, putting in two S2 AI screws, right down the same S2 block, this is what it looked like. The arm comes in the way, I put down the S2 AI screw, I release the driver and I move on with my life. Right? I reconnect all the instrumentation. So the idea of putting two S2 AI screws, you know, technically very hard freehand, maybe easier with fluoro assist, maybe a little bit less difficult with nav, becomes a very easy thing with robotic assistance. This was the final construct. And again, you see here, this was the surgical goal, right? To connect his old construct back into his pelvis. You can see here, good apposition of that plan. Right, putting in S2 AI screws, good apposition on the lateral right to that plan. And even more telling, this is gonna be the post-op CT and you'll see here the haloed iliac channel that we removed. The whole goal is to get him excellent iliac fixation. And you can see just as I planned, I completely avoided that iliac channel to get the screws in healthy, fresh bone as much as I could because that's the whole point. That's the whole point of the surgery. Right. But again, this illustrates the idea that this is something that I could not have done, you know, a hundred times out of a hundred had I used any other type of technology. I, I know, as many of you do, we all know how to freehand S2 AI screws. Right. But the use of this in this particular case was extremely helpful to accomplish this surgical goal. Right. Now, into the. Martin, the are part. you um, sorry to interrupt? Are you yes. able to, you know, in that post op CT that you showed, after you place all your instrumentation uh, robotically, are you able to obtain an intraoperative spin with some kind of CT-based system? Um, how, or when do you obtain your, 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 I guess, you know, second CT or to confirm sure. where all the implants are placed? Of course, that's a great question. I'll say that for my um, early degenerative cases. So I, I trained on the robot in fellowship with, with Ron Lehman. 
And um, at that time, the first few cases, I think he spun the O-arm and then afterwards he was comfortable enough with its accuracy that all he took were fluoroscopic shots, right? And, and he wouldn't even get post-op CTs anymore. For my first few cases, the first five or 10 cases, um, I would, uh, we didn't actually have an intraop CT yet. So we acquired the robotic arm before any intraoperative CT. So what I would do is I would shoot the um, fluoroscopy, right? Just to make sure that everything looked fine. And I would get post-op CTs, which in a way the cat's out of the bag if there is a malpositioning, but I would get the post-op CT anyway to either convince myself or convince the hospital or anyone else that it's accurate. After about five or six cases from one and two level degen to the deformity, I, I stopped getting CTs unless it was a deformity case, right? Because everything was already so accurate. Nowadays we have the arm, but I don't even bother spinning the arm. I haven't spun an arm check in a long time, uh, actually ever. Um, so my check is if I'm putting in screws and I still stimulate, and then I check with the x-ray as we've all been trained to make sure that everything looks reasonable within that. But because of the accuracy of the arm, I've never been so concerned that I, that I routinely spin the arm, um, although it's definitely a possibility. Okay. Hey, Martin, I have a couple uh, quick questions before you move on. Uh, that's a real uh, fascinating use of the technology. Uh, one question that I have is at this point in your workflow, uh, I think in some of those early cases, you show some inner body work. Um, does the robot help facilitate that at all at this point, or is that something you see coming down the road? Uh, I'm just curious, you know, you say like you're going to move on with your life. Uh, does it right now help you at all in terms of the execution of the osteotomies or doing the inner body work? Right now it doesn't. So, um, you know, I guess, uh, uh, this is not a industry talk, so I can, I guess, say whatever I want. Um, but from what I believe, a lot of the major um, corporations who have robotics, the R&D departments are designing that into the next iteration of arms, right? So right now, the first few generations of robotic platforms, all it's doing right now is putting in screws. And it's putting it in under heavy surgeon guidance, right? The surgeons have to checkbox everything as it moves forward. Um, the surgeons have to um, you know, clear every design. But the next iterations, the idea is to apply machine learning so that after, just like with Metacrea, right? After your first five or 10 cases, the machine learning algorithm understands where you prefer to put in your screws, right? So it spits out a template and then you fine tune it. There are ideas of attaching um, different types of end effectors, right? So right now it's just the hole and the hole you put down all your instruments. But it's not a leap to imagine that other types of things can be attached, such as drills, such as um, other types of guidance objects, right? Such as osteotomes. The, the robotics platforms are already capable of mapping the surface anatomy, right? It's this stepwise, um, one, adoption or acceptance of the surgeon and healthcare community, and two, making sure it's safe, and then actually applying it in a stepwise fashion. But it's, it's being developed right now. And so um, I'll say that's another, um, in a way, as part of this talk, another reason to um, look, you know, into spinal robotics because it is coming. These types of things are coming. Got it. And just one follow, uh, just another question from our uh, audience before you uh, move on. Uh, what about applications for the cervical spine? Um, you know, I think that, you know, just as, you know, we personally don't have a robot yet. Um, and I think for many who are you know from are watching from around the world that may not have access to that technology? Um, what, what's the application right now? The C spine, whether it's C one, C two, um, or else. Yeah, so the, the cervical spine, I, I have a great interest in you know from from a research and development standpoint, and we are lucky enough to actually to have two robots here. One that actually lives at our um, cadaver lab, and it's it's been on my my list of things to submit a grant to begin look into it, the robot is FDA approved from C1 all the way down, right? So it's safe to be used in the cervical spine. The problem is, is that there are no instruments yet, right? Every single instrument you see in these videos are designed for the thoracolumbar spine, right? So they're big, they're long, they're heavy, and the robot can be fixated to the spine to help with rigidity. When you're dealing with the cervical spine, it's much harder because instruments have to be designed that are smaller and easier to wield with a, an appropriate length. But just as you said, in my mind, I mean, 
I was already um, riffing at the point in the possibilities of cervical applications, right? Because we've all done corpectomies before, then you quote unquote back it up, right? What about the possibilities of PERC backing up those things, right? Controversial, is it appropriate, is it not? But it becomes possible. Things like C12 fixation, right? So it's an elderly person who comes in with a C2 fracture and all you need to do is just put in C12 screws, right? For someone who's old, who may pseudo already, and all you wanna do is just fixate them instead of dissecting all the way down and getting past the venous plexus, it's, it would be potentially possible to do PERC C12, right? Controversial, yes, it would be, but potentially possible with robotic applications. Um, in this way, it's still on the forefront, but hasn't yet been developed. Right, so um, moving forward into part two. So in this part, these are um, surgeries that we've done here at UCSD where I feel that the robotics platform was hey, really- Martin, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, it's Ali again, I apologize. Uh, quick, I, I think uh, Dr. Shin wanted to be uh, nice and not ask this question, but I, I'm gonna put you on the spot because this is what our participants want to know. You're obviously an expert in this and I really honestly commend you for, uh, for, being, uh, for kind of adopting this early, being an innovator. I think we need a lot of people like that. Uh, and I mean that genuinely, uh, I really respect what, you, what you're doing. But let's put this in practical terms for some of our participants from either the US or any other part of the world. Uh, you know, you mentioned say an MIS TLF, I think you showed a one or two level uh, TLF cases, right? Um, so, uh, you know, with the use, use of robotic technology, you're obviously very adept at it. What's your time? How much does a case uh, take? What is the length of the case for you uh, using the robotic technology for one level or two levels, say MIS TLIF or open TLIF? I mean, our, um, our one level TLIFs are still probably, uh, I would say about an hour and a half to two hours, right? So I think that is longer probably than some people. I know some people who are very adept at T MIS TLIFs and they can probably do it in an hour or an hour and a half. Um, there are others where two hours is about the average, right? And so in this way, using a robot for an MIS TLIF, a one or two level, you may not necessarily see the need. You may not necessarily see the advantage, right? And in this way, um, that is well accepted, right? And, and again, like I mentioned earlier, by no means am I saying that you, you should um, or have to use spinal robotics at all, nor should or you know, have to use it in, in every single case. And there are certain cases where without robotics, it's probably faster, right? Um, say for T4 to pelvis. Um, yeah, I was just, I was just going to actually ask you about that. So you, you were lucky enough to train with people who did it very, very freehand and then obviously, and who were very good at it and, and folks like Ron, who, who used the robotics. And so you've been exposed to both T4 to pelvis, let's say T10 to pelvis or T4 to pelvis. As far, forget the osteotomies and the correction and, and, and all of that, but placing the screws in a deformity case. In your experience, um, does it significantly cut down the time and does it increase the safety? So um, I will say that for a, a T4 to pelvis or T10 to pelvis, um, using the robot in my hands, it does not. It lengthens the time. And again, um, I've trained um, putting in freehand instrumentation since I was a PGY-4, right? And so um, I'm comfortable with it. We put it in very fast. Um, I, you know, touched up my techniques with, with Larry when I was with him. And so in my hands, even with an assist and showing them through, doing a T4 to pelvis freehand is faster. And, and I would argue just as safe, right? Um, I may have more breaches than a robot, right? But the breaches are usually asymptomatic. Right. And so in that way, using the robot um, for T4 to pelvis in my hands significantly lengthens the time because instead of uh, doing it in parallel, like I would usually do with an assist, you're doing it in serial on both sides and you have three registrations. Right now, for people who say aren't as adept at freehand, but still do it or say people who, as part of their practice, aren't, you know, a multi specialty group. Right, this could potentially offer avenues where they may be more comfortable, right? Where they, they already know how to do osteotomies or they, they already know how to do laterals, right? And so they do it minimally invasively. And what they want to do now is just put in the instrumentation. Robotics for those people, right? Which is a small group, probably, it offers an opportunity because it takes that variable, it doesn't take it off the table, 
but it attenuates any potential air or discomfort that people may have in putting in instrumentation in the thoracic spine or putting in iliac fixation or, or those types of um, bony trajectories. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I really appreciate your, 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 you know, obviously transparency and honesty, but that's really what we're trying to get here. So you, cause you are, you are focusing on the, on the, on the, you know, on the theory behind it and the philosophy behind it. And, and as somebody who genuinely is interested in this and, and working towards adopting uh, some sort of robotic technology in our center, this is exactly the kind of information I want. Uh, but it does make me think about something, right? Because what you said is folks who say, let's say they're not comfortable putting in uh, a pelvic screws or, 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 you know, multiple instrumented, you know, or, or a deformity case. Is the robotic technology going to make them feel more comfortable, number one? And number two, should it? So I, um, I, I have a great analogy that I'll, I'll proffer early and then return back to later on in my talk. And I remember um, a message and tweet that you had sent a few days ago about understanding the anatomy. And just like myself, it was drilled into me about understanding the anatomy and that you know, if, if you don't know how to put in a pedicle screw freehand, or if you don't know and understand the pedicle anatomy, then, you know, the, the hard liners, you shouldn't be putting it in, right? Now, I will make that analogy, because your question is, if, if people aren't comfortable putting it in just with existing technology, should they with the robot? I, I will return that analogy with driving, right? When you drive a car, cars were built with manual transmissions, right? I, I know how to drive manual. But the iterations of technologies are such now that things are automated, right? Now, and things are even on autopilot. Now, if someone gets a terrible score on their DMV and doesn't know how to drive a manual, should that preclude them from driving and getting from point A to point B? Now, just because someone is bad at putting in pedicle screws, this assistive technology, and I think that the analogy is a, a high tide raises all ships or something like that, it's meant to make things safer for everyone. Right, there is no closed door, and when you look at across the the value and experiences of spine surgeons across the country, right, there are a wide ranging levels of skill, and the whole purposes of technology is to make everyone safer. And so, although the robotics may not apply to the to the upper elite, right, who it will apply to are the surgeons who are board certified and who may be. You know, no one's mediocre out there, of course, but um, who may be less comfortable because it makes everyone safer. And I would argue that even if you don't understand the pedicle anatomy as you should, even if you can't three-dimensionally imagine it in your mind, if this allows you to put in a pedicle screw safely and get you to the next stage and you can accomplish the next stage of your surgical goal, doing the T-lift, doing, you know, say you, you run a trauma center, right? And you're the only neurosurgeon or spine surgeon or orthopedic surgeon out there. And instead of transferring the patient three hours to the academic center, you can now put in perk fixation for a chance fracture, or you can now open someone up and at least stabilize someone. There's an argument to putting in these types of assistive technologies in those areas. So, so I would make the argument as I will later that even if you don't understand it perfectly, even though everyone should, and that's the ideal, um, the technologies are still worthwhile. So I'm um, moving on to part two, and, and this is actually a perfect segue because in this part, I'm gonna talk about um, SRSPS OLIF and MIS deformity. Now, I started out my practice doing MIS T-lifts, right? The reason why I switched to OLIFs, and this is to, to, to um, Dr. Baja's point, is actually because of robotics, right? You can make an argument on the pros and cons of OLIFs over T-lifts over A-lifts all day long, which is not the purpose of this talk. But the reason why I switched to robotics was because I can now do things simultaneously, right? And to, to, to talk about your point in, in time savings, right? Nowadays, if you do lateral surgery, so not, not TLS, but say you do lateral surgery, you do your lateral and then you do your posterior, right? So the, the current practice for most people is that you make an incision, you expose all your disc spaces, you place all your cages, you close, you flip, right? For whatever indeterminable amount of time that is, then you make your incision and place your pedicle screws again under floor or nav, you place your rod, final titan, and then you close, right? Now, more recently, people are talking about, you know, SPS or, or single position surgery, right? So now you're your primary surgeon and you're an assist. And in this, the idea is that 
you do things, everything in the lateral position. So say you put in your screws first, right, under fluoro nav or robot, and then you go and you, you do your grafts and you place all your cages and then you put in your rod and then your assist helps you close. And this can be done in, in a variety of ways, right? Because if you do a, the robot, you have to do one step first. If you do a nav and spin your C-arm, you do another step first. So this is interchangeable. And the idea is that maybe it saves a little bit of time if you, um, you know, don't flip the patient. However, with the robot, what we've termed, you can do things at the same time, right? So as the anterior surgeon, I'm the OLIF surgeon, I incise and expose down all the disc bases. My posterior surgeon can now place all the pedicle screws under robotic guidance, right? Once that's done, I place all the cages and they're on standby because the C-arm's in the way, because the, the technology hasn't caught up to what I wanna do. So I still have to do it under floral with the cages. And then as I close, they rod and then close, right? And again, this is the time savings. And this is what we're able to do. So, so to your point, my MIST lifts are still about two hours, but my MIS one, two, and three level O lifts are now also two hours because of this very reason. So I've been able to do one, two to three level surgeries at two hours because of this, right? You can see here, O lift surgeon, here's my resident. We're working at the same time, working at the same time, right? This is another resident putting in screws another resident putting in screws as I'm exposing down the disk space, another resident team putting in screws, right? The, the, my chief showing, uh, I can't remember, if she, I think she's a two, she's not an intern, she's a two, how to put in screws, right? This is uh, another one of my twos putting in screws as I'm doing my OLIFs at the same time, right? To the point where it's brand new enough where we've released two, one is I think in pending acceptance and the other is in submission. This idea, this workflow that you can do things at the same time and which parts can you do it at exactly the same time and which parts you maybe need to, maybe need to pause, but this time savings, right? Especially if this is what we're talking about. Now, the next part of this is the idea of MIS deformity, right? Because this allows you to do a new approach and, and I, I'm gonna say it, it's disruptive, it's co controversial, right? I, I can't tell you if it's right or wrong, but it's possible. And these are things like long segment transfascial constructs, quad rods placed minimally invasively, multi-pelvic robot guided distal fixation. So this was presented proximal MLSS. This was presented at, at last year's CNS, putting in at the proximal junction transvertebral screws that start at the level below going into the level above to save the proximal junction and, and on and on, right? Because now what you can do, as I've shown earlier, and I'll go through these cases, you can start designing these types of surgeries that would definitely not have been possible before. Even under NAV, it would have been very difficult with even you know, the experts in NAV, but now are actually accessible to average surgeons like myself, average surgeons to people who are already excellent at doing what they do and the technology allows them to do it to the point where we again are also submitting this, right? So myself and Ron, minimally invasive robotic multi-rod long segment posterior fixation. So I'm gonna touch base on first, the OLIF cases, and then these MIS deformity cases um, before I run out of time. So again, a very standard case, L4-5 single position surgery, right? Very mild degenerative disease with a spondy at L4-5. You can see the planning. I've already planned the OLIF graft. So I think um, Dr. Shinner, Dr. Baj asked about the inner body. I can plan that, right? The cage goes in. This is the positioning, so single lateral positioning. Right during the case, you can see with Olif, and I have an exorbitant amount of Olif pictures, so you'll have to excuse me because I, I really love the procedure. I'm in front of the iliac crust. With this, I can see exactly where I am. So I haven't shot a single x ray, right? I've, I've shot the x rays to register, but this tells me I'm already at the correct level. This is the view of the Olif. Uh, here's you know the case, and then this is the incision. So very small incision under two hours because, again, my resident up here is putting in the screws, has already put in the screws. Standard case, four, five, right, degen spondy. Next case, a four, five ismic spondy, right? So you can see here a higher grade spondylolisthesis from, from an ismic spondy. Again, I'm planning out the screws. I'm planning out the trajectory of where I want my cage to go. I promise you this takes five minutes, right? It takes five minutes. It's like learning a pack system. Because of her radiculopathy, she had terrible right lower extremity pain. I didn't want to just depend on indirect decompression. So I told the robot, tell me where to go to access the facet, right? 
So with that case, you can see here, this is the iliac crest here, transitional anatomy. So it looks almost like a lateral alif, um, but I do all my own exposure, so it's fine. You can see here, this was where I marked four five. Posteriorly, the robot guides us to where the facet is, right? So taking no X-ray at all, the robot guides us to a pin. There's no instruments yet, because again, the, the instruments haven't caught up to what I wanna do, but we were still able to put down this minimally invasive tubular retractor, take off the facet, you can see here four five, I use a T-lip distractor to um, distract the disc space, put in the cage as usual, be an O-lip approach. And you can see pre-op and post-op. Again, this was maybe about two and a half hours, I think it was really difficult to, to, to distract her. Um, but again, single position case, and uh, she left the next day. She left on post-op day one, right? Adjacent segment disease, something else that's very common at four five, right? Prior five, one fusion with adjacent segment disease at four five, this was one of my very first cases. And so I only planned um, screws on one side. Nowadays, I planned it on both sides. But you can see here how I'm putting in the trajectory. So this way, the robotic arm just tells me where I should go. So what I would normally do shooting one, two, five x-rays, right? The robotic arm can guide me to that anti psoas trajectory, right? Once that plan is done um, in place, I think in this one, I have a... Uh, like a short 60 second video on, on what the simultaneous exposure looks like. But this is the robotic software, it takes five minutes, she's positioned laterally. And here, um, you'll see here, right? So the arm is sent to the OLIF trajectory. So this is where four or five is, right? So I know where four or five is with the OLIF or anti psoas approaches. Um, I can be in front of it, right? So it's a direct exposure like an ACDF. So this way I know just in general where my quarter is. We're doing it simultaneously. She's putting in the screws. I'm exposing gently down to the spine, right? Without moving the spine so it doesn't mess up the registration. And you can see the amount of time it takes to expose, right? Whether you do it yourself, like I do, or whether you have a vascular surgeon exposed, whether it takes 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, it's done at the same time as the screws, right? So no time is lost. I put in the cage. Uh, my assist tightens and, you know, final tightens the rod and screws while I close and it's done all at the same time, right? So this is that type of workflow. You can see here what the arm looks like when the arm is sent to my trajectory, right? So four or five in front of the uh, iliac wing. This is where I plan that trajectory to be, right? Again, because the OLIF is done as a, a visual exposure, it doesn't have to be right there, but it gives me a general idea of where I want my surgical corridor to be, right? This is what it looks like inside the operating room. I'm at the correct level, having shot no x-ray at all. And then uh, again, exorbitant pictures of the OLIF um, and the case, right? So pre-op post-op on CT, pre-op post-op, and then pre-op post-op on x-rays. Now, having done several of these single levels, this can also be done at 5.1, right? So again, I'll show you two cases at 5.1. Now you can do single position cases at 5.1, something that's not possible with x lift or pone x lift or lateral, sorry. But with the anti psoas approach, whether you use an OLIF or another company, right, um, I'm agnostic, but you can do this in single position, right? So you can see I'm planning in my screws, I plan my cage, I promise less than five minutes. For the uh, OLIF, right, you can totally see here, this is where I'm at. The big abdomen is out of the way. So another really key part for doing 5 1 as an OLIF versus, say, A LIF or T LIF. Here is the 5-1 disc, right? So great exposure of the 5-1 disc. I've exposed this while the screws have already gone in. You can actually see the screws are already in, right? Cage goes in at 5-1. And again, the, the pre-op plan with the uh, post-op image. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, pre-op plan with post-op image and then pre-op image with post-op image, right? So here's another 5-1, the last 5-1 case, spondylosis with radiculopathy. Again, doing this simultaneously in single position. Right. In this case, 5-1 level, I'm, I'm planning where the robot is telling me to go at 5-1. But you can also see I plan to do a facetectomy. This lady had already had multiple decompressions, and I, I wanted to take off the facet for her radiculopathy. Again, I didn't want to depend on indirect decompression. So here we are working at the same time. I'm exposing 5-1 now. So if you have an exposure surgeon to do it, whether they take 20 minutes or 40 minutes, as I'm doing this, all the screws are going in at the same time, right? And this is where the cost, uh, the time savings is for this type of surgery. You can see here the 5-1 disc space, right? The cage goes in. And you can also see, uh, I had my resident take off the facet 
but again, not a difficult uh, not a difficult task to localize because the robot has guided us there already. So all he has to do is look down this tube and take off the facet. Again, there's no instruments for this yet um, because the instruments haven't caught up to me. But you'll see here at 5.1, right? Trial, cage, great distraction. Um, you can see here the uh, post-op CT and the, the post-op X-ray, pre-op X-ray, post-op X-ray. You can also see us taking off the facet, right? To ensure that she both has distraction as well as a direct uh, decompression of the nerve, which we did again in single position. Right? Um, can we uh, can we just get to a, a few questions from the audience? Uh, please, please. Do we have time, John? Yes, please. Of course. Is that okay? Yeah, I think we just have a couple of really good questions, and we're we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, uh, we have uh, from, uh, let's see, Dr. David McKean, radiologist. I, I believe he's a radiologist from England, if I'm not mistaken, but he can correct me. He wants to know whether misregistration is common and how do you mitigate, uh, how do you mitigate this uh, if, if you have registration issues? Yeah, so misregistration is, is not common. And, you know, I, I do run a, a workshop here that, that discusses that. What's common is human error in a part of that registration. And I'll, I'll say this a lot of times. Our eyes recognize about 256 shades of gray. And as, as a radiologist, you, you may know even better than me. The machine software recognizes 16 million shades of gray, right? So when you input in this the software, it sees all of these images as a vivid painting versus for us when we're trying to look at x-rays and compare them, you know, it's, it's rote and rudimentary at best. So the software, which is what a lot of the money has been put into is, is excellent. So that's not where typically the errors go. The platforms themselves have a lot of built-in safety mechanisms so that if something is off, it doesn't allow you to proceed. So it has you say, take another x-ray or complete another step that you may have taken. Okay, got, got it. Thanks for answering that. Yeah, great. Well, it, uh, Martin, it is uh, just about seven o'clock Eastern. Uh, I think we have one last question that I think is a great question here. Um, and that's from uh, Mike Galgano. He's saying that, you know, as an academic spine surgeon, um, can you comment on how to balance advancing to the technology with uh, resident training and learning uh, conventional approaches, freehand technique? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so absolutely. So I'll, I'll answer that question as I sort of click through the slides. Um, again, just to, to soak in uh, what I'd wanted to at least illustrate for you. In terms of um, resident training, right? And this is something that I thought of a lot because I, I valued a lot of my freehand training. It allowed me to really understand the pedicle anatomy. It allowed me to assess my errors. It allowed me to, to learn things, right? With, with the robot, as you understand, you don't have the accessibility anymore to freehand in unless you do a portion of your cases as freehand. And so my thoughts on this is that instead of focusing all of the intraoperative time on putting in the pedicle screws now, right? You're, you can focus a lot more of that time in the important parts of the surgery, right? The important parts such as putting in the cage, doing the discectomy, doing the osteotomies, doing the rotting, right? As technology advances, putting in the pedicle screws is gonna be the least important thing that you can do. So, you know, understanding how to put in pedicle screws is like teaching your, your children how to drive a manual. Right? I mean, I can teach my child how to drive a manual transmission, but over time, it's going to become archaic, right? Because there are more important things. And so I would argue, and I'll, I'll quickly go over the screen as well to, to wrap up, these other ideas of, of robotics, right? Because putting in pedicle screws, which is a great segue, is like getting from point A to point B, right? The freehand technique is like driving, right? It's very enjoyable. It's a manual process. There's an emotional attachment. NAV is like cruise control with a technological assist. And then spinal robotics is like autopilot, right? You have this partial automation to free up your tasks. And again, if you have never seen autopilot, it is excellent, right? When you give up something, if you were to just give up driving, right? It's hard to do. We've been doing it for a long time, but you see the technology has caught up where it's safe, precise, and reproducible so that you don't have to do it anymore. I don't even have to understand where I'm going. I don't have to understand the road. I don't have to understand the rules, but it does it for me. And so in this way, and this is to Dr. Baj's point earlier, you don't have to use all these assistive controls to go everywhere. You can drive to the grocery store, but there are certain indications where you can use autopilot. Just like with spine surgery, you don't have to use robotics in every single case. 
But the point is, and this is where I kind of go into the idea of race car drivers, you know, Dr. Shin Bosch and Than, you know, I liken them to race car drivers, right? And I, I would even say like the NASCAR drivers, right? NASCARs um, use only manual transmissions, right? So you have to be on the point, you have to know exactly what you're doing, shifting from one to the other. And, and I would say that I understand because, you know, I love driving manual. For those of you who drive manual, the idea of heel toe downshifts, right? Heading into a corner, you have to brake, clutch in, push down the throttle to rev up, downshift, and then release the clutch, release the, the brake and continue through the curve. It's a highly precise maneuver, similar to placing a four or five screw into a faro pedicle at T4, right? But I would say that as technology has advanced, right? You have a manual transmission. We have dual clutches now that shift faster than us. We've already had automatics, but now we have one speed transmissions. All of your Tesla electric cars are one speed, right? There's no gear to change. And as we know, Teslas are extremely fast. And so my point here, and this is, this is a really key point, you can use a one speed transmission and not shift and still be a race car driver, right? Just like you can use spinal robotics and still be a badass spine surgeon. They are not related. And in this way, spinal robotics is just an iteration of technology. It's not something that necessarily has to be combative because here, this is the partial automation of a task, right? And I, sh I showed this video earlier, and now we have that opportunity in the operating room. Because when you do things by hand, such as doing math, you can solve a lot of great problems. But if you just let things go and allow certain things to be partially automated, the things that you can do are things like this, right? So this, if none of you have ever seen it, is the self-landing of the SpaceX Falcon rocket, right? So this is a reusable rocket. And you'll see here a vantage point where it is in space, right? It is in orbit, well, not in orbit, it's in space. You can see the curvature of the earth, right? And you can see it descending through the atmosphere under partial and full automation, right? Going through the atmosphere, going through the sky, finding its target in a teeny tiny rectangle in the ocean and landing upright, all due to robotics, right? So in this way, I mean, it's Tesla, right? Tesla developed this technology with SpaceX. If you use this technology with partial automation from enhanced autopilot and you can land Falcon 9 rockets, right? The technologies that we have now in the operating room are just the beginning, right? And we're talking about surface and bone mapping, guiding laminectomies, robotic drill bits over and over and over, things that we had gone over um, earlier. And so focusing on the pedicle screw, you know, it's such a small part of it, right? Do you put in the pedicle screw with nav? Do you use fluoro? Do you use freehand? Do you use the robot? It's just a small part of the picture. Because when you think of the bigger picture, right, there's a bigger picture to the idea of spinal robotics and partial automation in the operating room. And that's this idea that it begins to disrupt certain ways that we do surgery. And I showed you simultaneous robotic surgery. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to show you MIS deformity. All of my patients went to the floor. All of my patients um, didn't have any blood transfusions. They left in four and five days. So it's a really disruptive way of doing new things. And really, um, the sky's the limit. So I do apologize for, for going over time, um, but I did, uh, uh, I'm glad for everyone that stuck it through. And um, thank you again for the opportunity. I'm happy to answer uh, more questions as well. Well, great. Thank you so much, Martin. I think uh, it's really, I think this is a great forum um, really to check out new technologies. And, you know, I think the value is really just seeing how everyone approaches these problems that are pretty much universal, but with using different techniques and, um, you know, it's, it's really uh, fascinating to see. So thanks again for uh, spending time with us and sharing your expertise. I think, uh, I think we all sort of learned a lot. And, um, and again, it was really great exposure. So thank you. I know, I really, I really appreciate the invitation. And, um, and if any of you have any questions, you can, of course, always, you can just email me. It's just my name, martinfam at gmail. I'm so happy to chat or discuss um, any, uh, anything that you have. Okay, thank you, great. Martin, so much, man. And right, so, so uh, everyone, uh, next week, uh, Dr. Vasuli, do you just want to give everyone an idea of what we can expect next week? 
Yeah. So, uh, Martin, that, that was awesome. I'm a big believer in the, um, in the utility of, of, uh, spinal robotics. And that was a, a beautiful presentation. I encourage all of our audience, by the way, you, you showed some of your uh, papers at the end and operative neurosurgeries. Those are some of the best papers I've read on like really the nitty gritty of how to, how to like, how to, from A to Z, um, set up a, an OR case and then, and get these cases done. So they were really awesome. So thank you for doing those. Um, the, the next iteration of our, um, of our, I guess, 21st century, um, intraoperative, um, uh, operative adjuncts will be the use of augmented reality, the uh, the headset. So we'll be doing um, a, a talk on that next week with uh, Dr. Steinberger from um, Mount Sinai, who has been using that technology um, a lot. So uh, I look forward to seeing everybody there. Thank you so much and um, have a great weekend, everybody.